I'm very pleased and I'm very excited to be here today and um, for this opportunity to share my work with you. Um, so the talk um, today will be very closely based on my uh, recent article that got published with uh, the journal Critical Research on Religion. And the article was entitled Speaking Religion Through a Gender Code, um, the Discursive Power and Gendered Racial Implications of the Religious Label. Um, and I very much look forward to your comments and questions later on. This is a very different audience for me today. I've presented this paper and these arguments to a political science and to, a, to an international relations audience before. I've also presented it to the community of scholars uh, in critical religion, but I haven't presented them to scholars um, of theology or Islamic studies, which I know uh, is a background that a lot of the scholars and students of the Al Mahdi Institute might come from. Um, and I think this is really interesting because it means that for you and for me, religion is real. And also, but we also know that it's a construct. And I also think it might be especially interesting for an audience who, like me, um, might identify as religious to then go back to the very origins of, um, of the European invention uh, and look at how the category religion in Europe has emerged and how it was first a term that was exclusively applicable to the Christian faith, right? And was then later on with the onset of um, the project of Western modernity and colonial expansion stretched to also encompass other belief systems and uh, of other peoples and cultures around the world. Um, so yeah, today we usually think about religion as something that uh, doesn't really need to be defined. And it's a sort of, uh, you know it when you see it kind of phenomenon. It's uh, usually commonsensical to most of us, right? We know uh, Hinduism as a religion or Buddhism as a religion. Uh, we know the Abrahamic religions, including Islam, are so-called uh, world religions. Uh, but what counted as religion uh, has changed over time and is still not completely uncontested. And this is my entry point into this conversation on religion. So I'm departing from that understanding of religion as, um, and to quote uh, Talal Asad here, as the historical product of discursive processes. So that's an understanding of religion as a rather recent and modern and colonial invention in Europe. And I look at how this invention uh, was also a specifically gendered one and connected to that also racial one and what the implications of this uh, gendered invention of religion are and what they might look like. So um, yeah, in this talk today, I will cover a, a couple of points. Um, I will first talk a bit about how um, religion as a category when it emerged in Enlightenment Europe uh, is gendered, both historically and discursively, and uh, I'll explain what that means. And connected to that, um, how this feminization of the modern category of religion can be observed in the very popular um, so-called good versus bad religion narrative. And uh, lastly, I'll also talk about how the concept of religion was basically reinvented uh, for colonial purposes. It was imported into and onto um, other cultures and belief systems uh, around the world where it didn't necessarily always naturally fit or pre-existed in that form, right? And uh, one uh, example that we could maybe relate to quite easily is the Arabic word deen, which often gets translated as religion um, in lack of a better word, but it doesn't really quite cut it, right? It doesn't really translate that well. Um, but it's just what might come closest to this Western idea of religion. And there are other cultures who had the exact same problem, where oftentimes a pre-existing belief system or cultural practices had to be reframed as religion to comply with the well, Western understanding of something that resembled the model for religion that the West had invented and for which um, the original model was Christianity, right? So a case in point um, was how Japan invented Shinto um, um, in the 19th century. And um, there is also a lot of debate um, on Hinduism and whether it fits into this very narrow template of religion, which is based on, on the Christian model. But again, this importing of religion into non-Western context um, served a very specific purpose and was also made possible, I argue, through uh, the gendering of religion. Um, and I will explain this and come to this. And so basically the main idea I will talk about today is how the category religion as it emerged in post-Westphalian Enlightenment Europe is a gendered category and a gendered invention. 
And to be more precise, religion in modernity is a feminized category. And it has been invented as a category that belongs to the feminized private sphere, whilst politics, which is often presented as the counterpart to religion, belongs to the masculine secular sphere. So religion has been constructed in, in opposition to the masculine public sphere of rationality, of politics, of science. And the narrative about religion is that it's personal, it's private, it's not rational, it's a subjective, it's an affair of the heart, um, an emotion, and therefore something that needs to stay out of politics, right? So um, essentially what I do um, is I'm looking at not the content of religion that would involve um, maybe defining religion, what counts as religion, what doesn't, uh, or what are the major components of a religion, but rather I'm interested in what is the discursive power of religion? What is the discursive power of the category religion? And that means what does it mean to be using the category in discourse and to be assigning um, the category religion to some practices or actors or beliefs or, or cultures? And also what does it mean to deny the label religious to some practices or actors? So in other words, what are the implications of this discursive power of religion? And there are implications, right? So uttering religion has consequences. They can be good, they can be bad, but they have consequences. Speaking religion does something. And I argue that speaking religion has gendered consequences. And um, attaching a gendered and racialized category such as religion to an actor or an action or anything else really also feminizes and consequently also racializes that actor or action or, or belief system it was attached to. And this has especially significant implication, uh, implications in the arena of global politics. So to give you a very brief example, um, before I explain the feminization of religion in more detail, um, and this is basically what I wrote my PhD on, um, within global politics, if you have a group or a political actor labeled as a terrorist actor, that's always bad. It has consequences for how this group will be reacted to and treated discursively and practically and what measures will be justified against this group. But if you have the same group labeled as not just terrorists, but religious terrorists, that's even worse. So the consequences are even more significant. This group will now most likely um, be denied any kind of rationality. It will be labeled as non-negotiable, as extremely irrational, as dangerous, as lethal, um, and therefore also as a group that, uh, or as a group against which um, extreme and exceptional measures can be justified. And that's because, as I have argued, religion is associated with feminized qualities attached to irrationality, which signify danger in a way that is not expected of secular actors. And I wrote my PhD thesis on um, the colonial origins of this phenomenon that I refer to as the religious terrorism thesis. But this is just one example um, to illustrate um, the point that the religious label is a powerful one and can have significant consequences that matter in international politics and also in domestic politics, right? So to come back to religion, this means uh, that I'm studying religion as a power category. And scholars of the discipline critical religion have long argued that the focus in studying religion should be in understanding um, how the category works and functions and what it does and in what circumstances it emerged. And the circumstances in which it emerged are very important to look at. So the invention of a religion as a category that was distinct, uh, that was distinct from its counterpart, the secular, serves a very specific purpose at the time in Europe and was pivotal for the establishment of the project of Western modernity. And um, yeah, how, how did religion emerge? So I'm going to read out this quote from Gunning and Jackson who very aptly uh, summarized this in one sentence. So according to them, religion is a product of a particular political and social trajectory of European politics, when as part of the rise of the modern state and in response to religious wars, religion was relegated to the private sphere and conceptualized as a set of irrational beliefs and in opposition to rational science. So the narrative about the modern concept religion is also the narrative about the birth of modern Europe, so to speak. And according to this popular myth, uh, which still gets taught in schools, by the way, and in the discipline of international relations, which is my background, and although it has been refuted by historians, um, this popular myth 
uh, still holds that Europe's uh, bloody and 30 year war in the 17th century was caused by religion. And it ended when religion was confined to the private sphere and made separate from the public secular sphere. And this is what Kavanaugh, uh, William Kavanaugh in his 2009 book refers to as the so-called myth of religious violence. It's this popular and conventional wisdom that the peace of Westphalia by separating church from state power ended an era of bloodshed that was caused by religion. And this is also where this popular but baseless uh, assumption about religion's inherent uh, propensity to violence comes from. So basically where I come in with my article is that I analyze this historical process of privatization and relegation of religion to the private sphere as a clearly gendered one. Because the private sphere in Western thought has always been associated with femininity and the realm of women, uh, the realm of emotion, which stands in stark contrast to the public sphere of politics and rationality, uh, and which um, and that's the sphere that has been associated with uh, masculinity and the world of men, traditionally speaking. And this is also how religion is feminized historically then, but it is also feminized discursively. And that means that um, the attributes attached to and associated with religion are feminine attributes that are attached to emotion, irrationality, but also danger. Um, and before I um, delve into this uh, in more detail, uh, let me briefly explain how the gender approach, which is the frame for how I theorize about religion actually works. So this is essentially feminist theory, but in this case, it has very little to do with uh, women or gender inequality on the individual level, which is usually what feminist theory is associated with and rightly so, but it is much more than that and applies to much more than that. So for the purpose of analyzing um, the discursive power of religion, I'm not concerned with um, individual level gender dynamics between, for example, women and men, but rather um, it's about taking a step back and zooming out from gender um, on the individual level to look at gender dynamics on the meta level, uh, if that makes sense. So um, how are masculine and feminine identities inscribed on states, on institutions, on concepts, and how's the very language that we speak gendered? And what are the implications of that? So in politics, uh, especially in global politics, for example, if we refer to um, a weak state, right, or a fragile state, or even a developing state, uh, that is essentially feminizing that state. Um, and that is inscribing, that's because it is inscribing a feminine identity onto that state, because weakness is associated with femininity and attributes that are associated with femininity in the West, generally speaking uh, and historically, are not valued. Whilst attributes such as strength associated with masculinity are always valued over and above its feminine counterpart. Right, and um, just to go with this example a bit further, in international politics, when you do label a state as a weak state, that's a speech act because it allows you to do things. You've now infantilized that state as not capable of governing itself. So the assumption is now, worst case scenario, uh, it is okay to intervene or invade that country, which by the way, is a striking parallel to the colonial logic that justified the dispossession and colonization of other people's lands during the colonial era. So the people whose lands were colonized were first feminized as weak, as less developed, as irrational, and that was the basis um, of the justification of colonialism. And by the way, this is a point I'll make later on, um, assigning religion to them also served that purpose of, make, of feminizing them further and making them come across as even more irrational. So this is how feminist theory matters beyond just the individual level. So you can feminize a state and you can feminize a concept like religion and it will have practical consequences. So um, to get back to religion, if we look at how um, the category religion has emerged in Europe and what the discourse on religion and about religion looks like, we can very clearly see how a feminine gender identity has been inscribed on the modern concept of religion. So religion, um, to use Sarah Ahmed's terminology here, religion has become sticky uh, with feminine attributes such as irrationality, such as emotion and subjectivity. And religion is seen to stand in opposition to science, to reason, to rationality, to politics and to power. So it is clearly gendered. 
and its gendering serves a purpose. It gives legitimacy to the secular nation state. It gives power and authority to the masculine secular nation state in Europe at the time. And this feminization of religion is constitutive of Western modernity, and it legitimizes the Western, the secular nation state. So um, the question that might now arise is, well, why else is it significant to look at this gender dimension of the modern category of religion? Well, I argue um, that it helps to illustrate how the category functions and how its discursive power works. So something that feminist theory has pointed out is that once something has been gendered as either feminine or masculine, um, an automatic uh, expectation is now placed on it to also conform to this gender identity. And this is um, essentially Judith Butler's famous theory on gender performativity, right? So um, J Judith Butler theorized about how men's and women's gender conforming or basic gender non-conforming behavior or actions get punished by society and is portrayed as unnatural and as wrong. So uh, a man, for example, um, who is seen to um, behave in a way that is usually expected of women or who's seen to um, um, expose uh, attributes that are usually seen as or perceived as feminine can then be made fun of or teased as unmanly and vice versa for women. Um, and to bring back another example from the realm of uh, global politics is the case of violent women, right? So women have traditionally been gendered with feminine attributes such as uh, being motherly, nurturing, peace-loving, passive, non-political. However, there are many women, of course, and obviously in this world and in history who do not confer, uh, conform to those um, gendered expectations. And a case in point here, and that's a really fascinating one, are female terrorists. So women who choose to act violently, as is usually expected of men, um, and so basically there's a very interesting book um, written by Gentry and Schoberg, which shows how female terrorists are depicted in popular media, but also in academic discourse, as even more dangerous than their male counterparts when they choose to act violently. And this is because their violence is portrayed as not just wrong, but also unnatural. They are going against their true uh, female nature of being a mother or a wife or a daughter. And instead they choose to uh, blow themselves up or shoot other innocent people. So when they do what men do, it's even worse. It's more dangerous because it's more irrational and fanatic because they go against their nature, right? So these women are then portrayed as doubly dangerous and doubly deviant. So uh, this might seem a bit um, unrelated to the topic of religion, but actually, and I argue, you can see the very same dynamic play out with religion. So the way Europe has invented religion with a feminine gender identity means religion is portrayed as true and as good religion when it conforms to this identity and stays in the private sphere and adheres to that Christian centric secular model. So we essentially in popular discourse, we have two faces of religion. We have the true face, the true so-called good religion, which is um, the peace loving, non-violent, non-political religion that stays in the private sphere. And then we have the second face of religion, which is the barbarous, uh, violent, irrational kind of religion that goes against its true nature. That's bad religion, right? And bad religion is a return to Europe's distant pre-modern past. So guess what? In most cases, Bad religion is attached to non-Western, non-Christian religions, right? Because Christianity is seen to have already arrived at that developed uh, state and has moved beyond that past of its religious wars and religion being irrational and violent and being in the uh, public sphere. Um, and instead, Islam has a long history of having been portrayed as the port basically the prototype of bad religion, which still has not arrived at the developmental stage that Christianity in Europe now has. So um, this very clearly shows um, also the racial element of the European invention of religion. Um, it is modeled on Christianity. That means all other forms of religion will be measured by its proximity to the Christian ideal secular template. So the further away from that template uh, religion is seen to be, um, the more likely they will be labeled as bad religions, as less developed religions, as less rational religions, as more dangerous religions. And actors within global affairs who bring religion into politics are regularly labeled as irrational extremists, as radicals, as fanatics. And they're often denied the rationality that is implicated 
in secular political actors. So global actors who do the very same acts of violence and protest out of nationalistic reasons are less likely to be labeled as um, irrational radicals um, or fanatics than the same actors doing so out of supposedly or allegedly religious reasons. And this goes back to the very example of religious terrorism that I gave earlier, right? But what also needs to be kept in mind here is that actors from regions that are seen as historically more religious than Europe uh, will be labeled as religious actors regardless of their self-identification. So you can you bet you can bet that if there is a new terrorist actor emerging somewhere in the Middle East tomorrow, they are very likely to be perceived and really um, readily also to be labeled as uh, religious actors, even when their prime mission or goal is a nationalistic one. And um, if we look at the example of the IRA in Ireland, for example, this is a European case, um, and the IRA very rarely has been labeled as a terrorist organization motivated by uh, Catholic interpretations of the Bible uh, or the Christian faith more generally, but rather their nationalistic goal has always been accepted as their prime mission and their Catholic faith has not been foregrounded in the same way that many actors in the Middle East would have and still will. And this brings me to the point on how religion has been imported onto other cultures or imposed on other cultures or belief systems. All right, so um, interestingly, what we need to keep in mind here is that when Europe uh, went on to discover the rest of the world, discover, um, they were very reluctant to apply the concept of religion to other cultures at first. Uh, and the local customs they encountered did not fit the template of religion because it was based on the idea of Christianity. So at first, other cultures were often not deemed rational or developed enough to even have a religion. So denying them religion was openly dehumanizing them and dehumanizing their cultures and, uh, and their peoples as less developed and not having arrived at the state where, you, where well, Europe has now arrived at. Um, because uh, having a religion in the first place was seen as a marker of civilization by Enlightenment thinkers. And um, paradoxically though, the marker of advanced civilizations was also the subsequent loss of religion in the public sphere, right? So Max Weber, for example, um, he held that the Occident constituted the highest form of civilization because it had arrived at a status where religion was now dying out. And that meant that all other regions outside of Europe, um, some more, some less, were still believed to be superstitious and still had to basically free themselves from the irrational grip of religion they were still in. So the colonial project basically went hand in hand with the assigning and denying of religion. So many African tribal cultures were thought to have um, no religion at all. And then um, because they weren't seen to be developed enough. And then Asian religions uh, religions were very often put on a very early stage of development um, and monotheistic religions were put at the top of the so-called racial religious hierarchy uh, because they were seen to um, be closest to the Christian model. However, important to note here is that um, that wasn't the case for Islam. So Islam for a very long time was considered an ethnic and tribal religion uh, for Arabs only, and therefore not considered a monotheistic religion that had proximity to the Christian template. So Islam too was put at the very bottom of that racial religious hierarchy for a very long time. But uh, what is important here is that religion um, was a tool to mark irrationality. It was a colonial tool, it was used as a colonial tool, and the assigning of religion uh, was used as a mark of more or less rationality, essentially. So again, that shows very clearly the gendered implications of speaking religion. So assigning religion actually feminized these people even more. And, and very, uh, a very fascinating example was the case of Hinduism. Um, and I find that it clearly shows how this gendering function of religion worked. So when a colonial administrators in India first they discovered Hinduism, right? Um, they were very reluctant to apply um, the term religion to it. Because, okay, actually, let me get back. Religion, um, can, uh, Hinduism in India can originally and best be described as maybe the dominant culture which colonizers discovered in India and which constituted an important part of being Indian um, and Indian identity. 
So when colonize, when the British colonizers um, came and uh, were first very reluctant to apply it, they later on changed their mind and did apply it. And it fulfilled, when they did so, that's because it fulfilled a function um, that very clearly illustrates the gender nature and power of religion. So basically classifying Hinduism as a religion helped the colonial purpose of marginalizing and privatizing two very gendered processes. Um, so marginalizing and privatizing what it meant to be Indian and instead impose and make public the rational British colonial order, right? So just assigning the label religious to some local practices basically um, had the effect of uh, um, privatizing them, um, making them come across as more irrational, and thereby at the same time also making it possible for the British to impose their colonial order as the public one that needed to be adhered by. So speaking religion basically served the colonial purpose of constructing Indians in stark contrast to British colonial masculinity as naturally effeminate, as emotional, as superstitious, um, and um, still very susceptible to religion. And therefore, as a people who are still very prone to the irrational grip of religion, uh, hence not fit to govern themselves. So in my article, I argue that speaking religion, because it is a gender concept, was constitutive of the infantilization and the feminization of the colonial subjects and their practices and their beliefs. Because basically religion is gender, that means it's also gendering, right? And by the way, this is also um, um, the main criticism I had um, on the book Dune. So the movie came out quite recently. And for those of you who are not familiar, Dune is the story of Paul Atreides, of the House Atreides, whose family with their army go to take over and colonize this desert planet Arrakis. And the natives of that planet are called the Fremen and um, of Freeman. And uh, Herbert, who's the author of the book, and the book's uh, plural, but I only read the first book, uh, he was clearly uh, inspired by Islamic mythology and religion when he wrote the book. And so the Fremen, uh, he writes, as um, are the desert people. Um, uh, and it's very clear that he was inspired by Arab Bedouin culture and peoples when he wrote the Fremen as the natives of that planet. Right. But what really irritated me in the book was how he portrayed the Fremen as naturally very susceptible to religious and irrational ideas and to religion more generally, and therefore as naturally superstitious and therefore prone to be accepting this guy who just arrived on their planet as their new prophet and savior. And so this just shows a very colonial logic of this idea of non-whites as especially prone to religion because they're just not there yet. They haven't developed in the same way that the white man has in Europe, so they're not as rational, right? Uh, and again, this shows the connection between whiteness and Christianity and how whiteness is implicated in Christianity and rationality is implicated in it. Um, so to come back to the topic and actually to wrap this up and sum this up, um, I have argued that religion is gendered in its very conception and the implications of this become clear when we look at what religion does. In colonial context, it has quite literally um, served as justification for the subjugation and infantilization and racialization of peoples. And in more contemporary contexts, we need to critically investigate how the religious label can discredit actors in the arena of global politics and how especially non-Christian and non-whites, non-white peoples are vulnerable to this uh, feminizing function and discursive power of religion. Um, and we don't even need to go as far as global politics. We can stay right here in the UK and look at the discourse on prevent and how it has been clearly designed to uh, apply to Muslims who are thought to be more susceptible to religion, to religious ideas, to be radicalized by those religious ideas, and to be then uh, inserting those ideas into the public uh, realm, right, where it shouldn't go. Um, and I want to end here, and want to because I want to give as much uh, time as possible to questions and answers, and I'd be very interested to hear what connections you've made between this gendering function of religion and processes or discourses on global politics or domestic politics, if at all. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to end here. Thank you very much for listening.